Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Barclay Square, starring Ronald Coleman and Maureen O'Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. If any of you are thinking of writing a novel, I commend to your attention a little-known volume by one of America's best-known novelists, Henry James. It's called The Sense of the Past. It contains not only this novel, but also the author's notes, which he jotted down while working. And it contains one of the most fascinating ideas ever put on paper. The idea behind tonight's play, Barclay Square in which a young man, through his love of the past, breaks through the barrier of time and finds the girl he loves in the 18th century. Before reaching the screen, the play suggested by Henry James' novel was one of the great successes of our generation. It was filmed by 20th Century Fox, and it comes to you tonight on the Lux Radio Theater with two favorite stars, Ronald Coleman and Maureen O'Sullivan. I suppose all of us have at some time toyed with the idea of visiting the past and reliving some romantic period that appeals to us. And certainly, 18th century England is one of the most picturesque with its colorful, elaborate costumes. <laughs> you, you can imagine how helpful Lux Flakes would have been in taking care of those voluminous, expensive garments. In fact, Lord Chesterfield, the arbiter of fashion of that era, prescribed that not only should one's clothes be well made, and one's wig well powdered, but one's linen should at all times be extremely clean. If Lord Chesterfield could pierce the barrier of time like the hero in tonight's play and visit the 20th century in America, I'm sure he would add a hearty recommendation for Lux Flake. Now the clock points to curtain time, and here's the first act of Barclay Square, starring Ronald Coleman as Peter Standish and Maureen O'Sullivan as Helen Pettigrew. How many of us have longed to escape from the narrow limits of reality into the romance and excitement of another time and another century? But if we could journey back into the mystery of the past, what would we find? Contentment or unhappiness? This is the narrative of a man who made such a journey. A man who went from today into yesterday. London, 1939. A week ago, a member of the staff of the American Embassy resigned his post to assume a commission as military observer with the British Expeditionary Force. His name is Peter Standish. This is his last night in England. And now in a large and venerable home in Barclay Square, he sits alone, writing feverishly. I am leaving England tomorrow. My orders read that I'm going to France. A lot of bother and expense to the War Department, for I do not think I shall return. My hand is steady as I write. My mind clearer than it has been all my life. And I am happy. But I can't help wondering what purpose I serve by writing down the events I have experienced since coming to Barclay Square two months ago. Perhaps it is with a faint hope that poor Marjorie someday shall find this, and reading it will understand. Or perhaps in writing, I can live it all again. It began with the day I found the crux and tatter. It also was on that day that Marjorie came to see me. Marjorie. Hello, you. Aren't you going to kiss mm-hmm. me? Again and again, if I may. Well, that's better. Peter, do you realize you haven't seen me, not even called me for two days? Is anything wrong? Oh, no. No, of course not. Well, then... Finish up whatever it is you're doing and we'll... Why, Peter, I believe you've forgotten all about it. Uh, forgotten? What? Well, darling, tea, of course. Four o'clock with Mr. Little from the embassy. Oh, my dear. Well, well, I, I can be ready in a moment. A week's time. Oh, Peter, what's that there on your desk? Oh, I just found it in the attic. It's the Crux Ansata. Crux Ansata? I was looking at it when you came in. The Ansata Cross. 
Yes, I'm sure that's what it is. A symbol of eternal life. And that's not all I found. Look. A diary? Yes. Peter Standish's diary. It says here, his trip from New York to England took 27 days. The Revolutionary War was just over. He fought under Washington. Look. Look, look here. He says here that Sir Joshua Reynolds refused to finish his portrait. <laughs> but he did finish it. There it is on the wall. Look, it's obviously all Reynolds' work. Peter, that portrait... You know, I've always said you might have sat for it yourself. <clears throat> and his name was Peter Sandys, too. It's very odd. Yes, he married Kate Pettigrew, the elder sister. They lived right here in this house. Then there was a younger sister, Helen. And look, here. Here in the diary. Here, here's something about, about a shawl. A cashmere shawl that Helen's aunt gave her just before Peter's arrival here. You see? Look, minute details. Peter, I don't understand it. You don't understand what, dear? Well, this place, it's like a museum. Why would they leave things here for 155 years? Oh, the house has always been in the Pettigrew family. And for some wonderful reason, each new generation kept things just as they found them. Just as they found them through all these years. But this fascination it holds for you, it uh -huh. isn't... It's not natural. Oh, it's the most natural thing in the world, my dear. After all, it was a Standish ancestor of mine who built the place. Well, I still don't understand why old Mr. Pettigrew left it to you in his will. Because he knew I'd... I'd take care of it. What? Well, old Pettigrew is rather fond of me, I suppose. And after all, we were distant, distantly related. <laughs> but I, I've told you all this before, my dear. Yes, I know. And look, Marjorie, look. Just, just look at these letters. Dozens of letters from Peter Standish to Kate Pettigrew, courting her from across the Atlantic Ocean. And, and, and this one. The very letter he wrote Kate's mother the day he arrived in England. Read it. The Blue Boar Inn, German Street, September 3rd, 1784. Lady Anne Pettigrew, honored madam, having arrived within the hour, I shall do myself the honor to wait upon you at half past five o'clock in Berkeley Square. Peter Standish. Half past five. September the 3rd. Well, that's today, September the 3rd. The paper's yellow. The ink all but faded. But I imagine Lady Anne is reading that letter now. 155 years ago today, half past five, September the 3rd, 1784, he walked through that very door. Peter. Hmm? It's, it's not very flattering, you know, playing second fiddle to a house. Oh, Marjorie, my dear, how can I... You know, I'm... I... I'm almost glad we decided not to be married until Christmas. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. I'm afraid my feelings have been hurt, Peter. I'm, I'm ashamed of myself, Marjorie, but I can't see you for the next week or two. I mean, I, I must have two weeks to myself. Here. Alone. Oh, please trust me. Oh, I will trust you. I will. If you'll only tell me what this is all about. No, I... I can't. Please. Well, what's that? What? It sounded like a coach. A coach rattling over the cobblestone. It seemed to stop here. No. <laughs> no, it's nothing. But, Peter, a coach? Cobblestone? Yes, silly, wasn't it? Well, should we go and pick up Johnny Little? Oh, yes, and let's walk. A little fresh air will do you good. Uh, but I, uh, I have to be back here at 5.30. Someone coming? No, but I must be here. Mystery upon mystery. Very well, darling. You shall be here. I'm behaving very badly, Marjorie. I know it. I know it, too. <laughs> Why do you put up with me? Possibly because I love you. Thank you, Marjorie. But what in the world happened to Marjorie? I thought the three of us were going to have tea. Yes, so did I. We started out to meet you, Johnny, and then she... Well, then she said she'd better run on home. I'm afraid I've hurt her badly. Yes, you have, Peter. She telephoned me after she left you. She thought perhaps if I spoke with you alone that... What about? Peter, I've known you for a long time. There's something wrong with you. I'd like to know what it is. If I can, I want to help you. Help? Do I look as if I need help? Where have you been keeping yourself? I haven't seen you in a month. Oh, it's the house. Been taking up most of my time. The house? People can get morbid and musty shutting themselves up in old houses. Marjorie's really quite disturbed about you. Yes, I wish she weren't. Look here. Why don't you get away for a while? Yes, it would be great to get away, wouldn't it? Really away? There's still our adventures, John. Inconceivable adventures. Adventures? What adventures? Oh, why shouldn't I tell you? John, I believe that when I go back to my house in Berkeley Square... 
I shall walk straight into the 18th century and meet the people living there. All right, I told you now. I'll go and call up a psychiatrist. Oh, there's time for that, I think. Well, I never met anyone before who believed in ghosts. Well, who said anything about ghosts? I believe they're alive, John. That Peter Standish, my ancestor, is alive, and just as I'm living here, he's living there, back in his own time. Own time? The 18th century? Yes. Now, oh, hold on. Oh, I know what you're thinking, but, but maybe this will tell you what I mean. Now, suppose you're in a boat, John. A boat that's sailing down a winding stream. You watch the banks as you pass by. A few minutes ago, backstream, you passed a grove of maple trees. You can't see them now, can you? You saw them in the past. Of course. Well, good. Now, now you're watching something else. Before your eyes now is a field of clover. Now, in the present. And you don't know yet what's waiting for you when you round that bend in the river just ahead. There may be wonderful things there, but you can't see them till you pass that bend. It's in the future, isn't it? Really, Peter? Now, isn't it? Yes, it's in the future. All right. Now, remember, you're in the boat. But supposing I'm in a plane, high above you. I'm looking down, and in one glance, I can see it all. What is past and present and future to the man in the boat are all one to the man in the plane. Proving what? Well, don't you see? Proving that all time, time, real time, is nothing but an idea in the mind of God. John, how, how would you like to walk down the quiet streets of London, breathe the clean, fresh air instead of gasoline fumes, ride in sedan chairs, meet Samuel Johnson and John Adams, our ambassador, and, and how far would you get? You'd make mistakes. They'd find you out. No. No, John, no. I, I have a passport. Passport? It is a diary. The diary of a man who came to London from America. I know everything he did from the moment he arrived. Well, naturally, I, I'd have to do everything he did. I mean, I couldn't change anything in the 18th century that had really happened in the 18th century. Peter, for heaven's oh, sake. Well. It's five o'clock, John. Thanks for tea. Peter. And I'll call you. I'll call you in a few days. Uh, perhaps. <laughs> Where you said, sir? Which house? Uh, just a little further on. Uh, no, no, never mind. I'll get out here. But it's pouring, sir. Well, that's all right. Here. Uh, thanks, young man. Uh, by the way, what time is it? Time? About 25 minutes after five. 25 minutes after five. Thank you. Dummy. Honest madam, having arrived within the hour, I shall do myself the honor to wait upon you at half past five o'clock in Berkeley Square. Half past five, Berkeley Square. Five more minutes. Five more minutes. letter from our cousin Peter Standish. He's arrived in London. A letter? When did he dispatch it? From where? It came but now from the Blue Boar in German Street. By messenger. Here. Wait upon you at half past five. Why, I say, ma'am, it's almost that now. Storm or no storm, our Yankee wastes no time. Kate, you will welcome him downstairs. Oh, mother, not alone. Surely you'll present him to me. You will do as I tell you. I'd love the girl grows timid. Now look at Kate. Hook this Yankee Standish, and there need be no more talk of poverty in this family. Money. I know what you've in mind for him, dear brother. Drink and cards. A companion who will pay for your entertainment and your losses. Your future, future husband will find you sharp of tongue, my lad. Odd life, if only he'll take you. Mr. Throttle and the lady. We shall receive him, Mary. Throttle, that disgusting little man. Hush. You well know Mr. Throttle is to enter our family, too. And what of my poor sister's feelings, Mum? What's wrong with Throttle? She's none too good, perhaps. But fifteen hundred pounds a year. Thomas. Mr. Throttle and the lady. Lady Anne, Miss Pettigrew, and sir, your servant. Come in, Mr. Fossil. We have great news. I am aware of it. I met but now Major Clinton. He journeyed from America with your cousin, Milady. America, Thomas. Remember, you are not to say colonial. Yankee puppy, then. Milady, Miss Helen. You'll find Miss Helen in the music room, dear Mr. Fossil. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, uh. 
Lovely, Miss Helen. Lovely. Oh, thank you. Miss Helen, you are aware that I have your mother's permission to pay my visit. Surely you know my feelings, Mr. Strasser. At least, if your affections are not disposed elsewhere, I may continue to hope. I shall never marry. Helen. Yes, dear? Helen, our cousin Peter Standish is in London. And is oh. about to present himself. And Mr. Thrussell, Mr. Standish has written that he would buy a townhouse, a country estate. And a what? Thomas. Mother, I hear a coach. A coach? Quickly, Kate, down the stairs. Good luck with your service, Kate. Come, dear Mr. Thrussell. Helen? Helen, why must Mother do this to me? Only be yourself, Kate, dear. Our cousin will not eat you. <laughs> What happened to him? I don't know. But he must be here. We saw the coach from upstairs. Well, I thought he must have let himself in. Mary said she heard no knock on the door. No, she didn't hear it for the rain. Go and let the Yankee in. No, he's not there. I just looked. Well, someone must have let him in. Oh, of course. He's gone to the servants' quarters. He knows his place. I'll bring him back, sister. Yes, I'll wait. Who are you? Oh, you are your servant, sir, Kate Pettigrew. We'll bring you Act Two of Berkeley Square in a moment. Meanwhile, here's Libby with a bedtime story. That uh, that sounds interesting. Mm-hmm, for ladies only. Once upon a time, there were three pairs of rayon stockings. One. Two, three. They were really lovely, but alas, they were bought by a very careless girl. First, she wore pair number one. And that night she washed them. But oh, what she did. She used hot water and rubbed them with a cake of soap. And in just a few days, they were gone. <laughs> So then she wore pair number two and washed them. The next morning when she went to put them on, they weren't quite dry, but the careless girl put them on anyway. And that was the end of number two. She was furious. She was so mad, she went right down to the store where she bought the stockings to tell them about it. But the sales girl said, What a shame. But these are lovely stockings. With the right care, they'll really wear. Did you use Lux and dry them thoroughly at least 24 hours? So that night when the careless girl (laughs) took off pair number three, she did just what the girl in the store said. She made lukewarm suds with mild Lux flakes and squeezed them gently through the stockings. Then she rinsed them and hung them to dry. All that night and all the next day, too. And the last we heard, she was still wearing pair number three, which lived happily thereafter. Using Lux is the way to make you live happily with your stockings. There are all sorts of scientific tests that show stockings washed with Lux last twice as long as those washed with a strong soap or rubbed with a cake of soap. Yes, actual strain tests, hundreds of them, prove this. So better stick to Lux flakes for stockings. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of Barclay Square, starring Ronald Coleman as Peter Standish and Maureen O'Sullivan as Helen Pettigrew. (laughs) Barclay Square, September 1939. And at his desk, Peter Standish continues to write of the bewildering events which have carried him out of the present and into the year 1784 to the 3rd of September, 1784, when at 5.30 o'clock on a rain-swept evening, the door of this very room stood swung open and Peter Standish stood before Miss Kate Pettigrew. Um, have you had a tiring journey, cousin? I, uh, I just come over from America. Indeed. We had not thought you came from Poland, sir. Uh, in the General Wolf. Uh, we had not thought... Um, it, it took 27 dreary days. A ship? You did not swim across? Oh, cousin, I'm being a bore. 
Inexcusable for one who has just met his betrothed. Betrothed? Oh, come, Kate. It was all arranged in our letters. Or don't... Don't you want me to kiss you? Oh, not sir. I vow you are the audacious fellow I've told Helen we must expect. Uh, Helen? Oh, yes, your sister. Of course, if you want a formal declaration of my sentiments, I... I know exactly how it was done. Yeah, how it is done. Miss Pettigrew, fair cousin, uh, will you be my wife? Oh, you go much too fast, sir. Oh. Uh, tell me, Mr. Standish, in America, do visitors just walk into houses? Uh, walk in? But I pressed the bell. The bell? Uh, the buzzer. The buzzer? Uh, I, uh, I knocked, knocked. But who let you in? The door was ajar. I walked in. Raining cats and dogs, you know. But your clothes, your shoes, they're dry. Yes, it's the pair. And blood, the Yankees. Oh, uh, my brother Tom, Mr. Peter Standish. Uh, servant, sir. Mom, he's here. In here. In there. Mom, I present our cousin, Mr. Peter Standish. Oh, ten thousand welcomes, dear, dear cousin. And allow me, sir, our dear friend, Mr. Throssell, and my other daughter, Helen. Mr. Standish. Uh, Miss Pettigrew. Now then, sir, I'm ready to show you the town. Yes, by all means. Of course, I shall put you up in Brooks Club. You'll meet every gentleman in London at Brooks Club. And when you wish, sir, I shall be glad to present you to the president of the Royal Academy, Sir Joshua. Uh, Reynolds? Sir Joshua Reynolds, the painter? Whom else, sir? Ah, do you think he'd paint my portrait? Aye, at a hundred guineas. A monstrous sum, cousin, but he's the fashion. Our prospective brother-in-law, Mr. Throssell, may persuade him to paint you for less. Brother-in-law? Ah, oh, Tom, please. Helen, dear, what good fortune. Our cousin is here for your birthday reception. Your birthday, Miss Helen? Yes. Why, of course, your aunt's gift is for your birthday. The cashmere shawl. Oh, is it a shawl? She sent a parcel for my birthday, but I wasn't to open it until then. Oh, I'll go and open it now. Oh, strike me. How do you know about Helen's presence? Oh, I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> Just a hunch, a shot in the dark. Hunch, sir? Shot in the dark? No. An American jet. Look, it is a shawl. Is it? If I, I... Come, sir, how I... did you know? Well, here's a rival for you, Helen. Looky, cousin, can you read thoughts like my sister? Helen? Helen reads thoughts? Oh, at times I seem to see things that, that others do not. What things? Why, I believe you're trying to change the subject, Mr. Standish. Mom, I... I fear our cousin is not well. Oh, it's just a headache. A rather tiresome headache. Then you must rest till dinner. Tom? Come, sir. You to your room, and I to the blue ball for your boxes. It was rather stupid of me to have mentioned that shawl. And strange that Helen should be so quick to sense my confusion. Helen. The diary mentioned so little of her, and nothing at all of her second sight. Tom left me alone in the room, and suddenly, before a mirror, I saw an incredible sight. Myself, faultlessly groomed in knee breeches and silver buckles. A wig on my head and lace at my neck. I went to a window and flung it open. Yes, it was all true. I saw other men in the square, men dressed as I was dressed, and coaches and sedan chairs, and a watchman bawling the hour of the day. I, Peter Standish, had in the year 1939 swept time away and walked into another century. I was alive in 1784 in Barclay Square. And then, and then I heard music. A spinet. I followed the sound, and in a moment I stood again before Helen Pettigrew. You play very well, Helen. Oh. Oh, no, please, please, don't stop. Your headache is cured already, cousin? Completely. You really did not have a headache? No. How did you know about my shawl? No, no, please. No more questions. <laughs> Helen, I feel you're the only one here I can talk to. You'll help me, won't you? How can I help you, cousin? Well, it's... It's all so strange, all this. This? London? Barclay Square? And I didn't think it would be. It makes me uncomfortable. You can see that, can't you? Oh. Kate will soon put you at your ease. And you, Helen, are you really engaged to Mr. Thrussell? Tom had no right to say that. Mother would like me to be. I thought so. Look... 
we'll make a bargain. You help me out, and I'll back you up. Will you? I want... Oh, I keep forgetting. I can't interfere with things that really did happen. Hmm? I mean, you see, uh, my position here... <laughs> so awkward. Awkward, sir? You're reported to have 10,000 pounds a year. With that, you may do anything you wish. Perhaps... Perhaps you do marry Strassel after all. Never. Helen, look at me. Is there anything strange about me? Strange? Well, I'm an American, you know, and just come into this this new world. Uh, that's why I may seem nervous. The, the, the family's inside. Perhaps we'd better join them. Oh, no, no, please, don't go. Kate is waiting for you, Peter. Oh, yes. And my brother. He and Mr. Strassel spoke of taking you to Brooks Club. Brooks Club, yes. Yes, I, I think I shall like that. Would you look at him, Major? Just look at him. Well, perhaps he's never before viewed a gentleman's gaming club. That scant excuse to ogle like a country lout. When we came here an hour ago, he turned his back on the Prince of Wales. And why so, Mr. Throttle? Because his highness blew his nose with his fingers. Oh, come now, come. I sailed across the Atlantic with him. That doesn't sound like my Yankee at all. Hi, Standish. Uh, have I had the honor, sir? Well, Standish, you haven't forgotten Clinton. Major Clinton? Why, of course, but uh, uh, dressed like a peacock? Why, your own mother wouldn't know you. You don't seem the same man, I'm sure. No, you, sir. Not the same man at all. Well, well we must push off now, mustn't we, Mr. Throttle? Push off? Uh, well, you, you offered to take me to Sir Joshua. He's going to do my portrait, Clinton. But you haven't met him yet. Uh, he'll do it. He's got to. Well, Strassel, let's get a taxi and... Uh, I mean, uh, let's be on our way, shall we? A good day, gentlemen. A few minutes later, I was talking with the greatest portrait painter England has ever known, Sir Joshua Reynolds. In the days that followed, I made frequent visits to his studio... And one morning, Helen and Kate came with me. Please, Mr. Standish, the pose, the pose. Oh, hi, I'm sorry. Tell me, sir, now that you've broken away from England, you're determined to do great things in the, colon uh, in the United States, are you not? Oh, I suppose we shall. You see, Sir Joshua, our forefathers, uh, uh, that is, we, uh, we have brought forth upon that continent a new nation, Conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. All men created equal? But, sir, that proposition is absurd. Absurd? Uh, well, yes, dear. I, I suppose it does seem a little cockeyed. Cockeyed? Uh, an American term, Kate. We've, uh, we've invented a new language over there. Step down, Mr. Standish. I, I can paint no more today. Sir Joshua, what's wrong? His face. Something in his face. It completely eludes me. A very ordinary face, Sir Joshua. It is anything but that, Mr. Standish. It holds something I've never encountered before. Oh, now, what expression in any face could elude an artist who painted Mrs. Siddons, the mistress of all expressions, as the tragic muse? What? What did you say? The tragic muse. Sir, you make sport of me. You have talked with Mrs. Siddons? Peter. Peter, you haven't met Mrs. Siddons. I only say what everyone else knows. Surely, sure, surely the tragic news is painted. Come here. Look, behind the drape. You see, the canvas has scarcely been started. One sitting, Mr. Standish, that is all. Not even Mrs. Siddons knows the name I have in mind for this. The tragic news. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry I mentioned it before it happened, Sir Joshua. Uh, uh, when may I come again? If you wish, next Wednesday. I then I shall know if I can continue your portrait or not. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Helen's birthday was the next day. Late in the afternoon, I saw her alone in the garden. I had to talk with her. As I passed the drawing room on my way out, I overheard Kate and Lady Anne. But I tell you, Mom, I scarcely ever see him but that he's with Helen. Kate, this is unlike you. You think me jealous. Is that it, Jealous? You're a girl, my dear, and he is handsome and rich. Jealous? But no, I am not. Mother, when I am with him, I'm... I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? I do not know. But I love my sister. And when she is with him, I am afraid for her. Rubbish, child. Now to your room and get dressed. 
Have you forgotten the birthday, boy? May I, may I sit with you, Helen? Oh, oh my, what a sober face, Peter. Helen, are you afraid of me? How could I be afraid of one for whom I feel sorry? You're unhappy with us. You feel strange among us. Yes. Everything's so different. They all liked me at first, but now... I can see it in their eyes. Fear. That's because you look through us, Peter. You seem to know what we think. Even what we're going to do next. I wish I could help you. Oh, but you do, just by your sympathy. Oh. Even though you can't possibly know how much I need it. All oh, the days are all right. I go about your old London. That's the most marvelous experience that ever came to a living man. But at night, as I lay awake, it all seems like a nightmare. Until I remember you, Helen. Helen, you are not like the others. You, you're real, real. And I want to take... I'm Helen, Peter. And my sister is Kate, whom you're going to marry. Helen, Helen, where are you going? I'm going to dress for the party. Our guests will be arriving soon. There he is, Clinton. See? My God, you'd think there was no other man in London. A most amazing rebel, gentlemen. Why, every morning the servants must fetch buckets of hot water so Master Colonial may wash himself. Wash himself? All over? Every morning, Mr. Throstle. All over every morning? Well, we shall see about that. Uh, Standish. Uh, yes, Major? Uh, what's this talk of baths? You took but one bath aboard ship and you talked about that for a week. I, uh... Well, I... I cannot stand salt water, sir. But all over, Mr. Standy. Well, you admire the Romans, Mr. Strassel. The Romans bathe? Excessively so. In their degeneration. But the virile fathers of the Roman Republic were... <laughs> were, were doubtlessly as dirty as you. Yes, Strassel, I suppose you're right. Pray forgive me, gentlemen. Ah, Lady Anne. Peter, she's here. She's asking for you. She, my lady? The Duchess, Peter. Oh. The Duchess of Devonshire. You'll find her enchanting, Standish. Providing you do not keep her waiting. The music room, Peter. The music room. And after all, Mr. Standish, we would have yielded the tea tax. Why did you Americans insist on rebellion? Why? I suppose, Duchess, to, uh, to make the world safe for democracy. Democracy, sir? Uh, but surely you don't begrudge us our poor stretches of wilderness. You upon whose empire the sun never sets. The sun never sets. Sir, England has seldom received so magnificent a compliment. <laughs> yes, it is rather a good phrase, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now about Miss Pettigrew. She will make you a devoted wife. And I'm sure, Mr. Sandish, you are her very first love. Uh, men always want to be a woman's first love, Duchess. Women have a more subtle instinct about things. What they like is to be a man's last romance. Oh, no, I swear there's no nimbler tongue than this in all London. <laughs> and are you certain, as I am, that Miss Pettigrew is all you would want? All I want? Ah, uh, I have found there are in this world only two tragedies. One is not getting what you want, and the other... Is getting it. Oh, <laughs> a charming aphorism, Mr. Standish. Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire. Now, what makes you mention my name? Oh, I didn't mean to. The, the, the honor. I'm overcome. You roll it out as if you were announcing me at court. All the grace of the period seems to center in that name. In English history, it is the finest flower of an age of elegance. We know your face from Gaines... Uh, Gainsborough has painted you, hasn't he? Yes. Ah. All the legend and beauty of this time cling about you. What can the 18th century offer that can even compare with... Wait! With. You speak of me so strangely. I find your compliments becoming a little disturbing. A disturbing? You were talking of me as one might talk of uh, uh, the late Monsieur Voltaire in the past tense. Oh, I made no use of past tenses, Duchess. You were thinking of me in the past tense. Yes. You've spoken of me as though... as though I were already dead. Oh, dear me, and I tried so hard to make an impression. Sir... You have made an indescribable impression. You may leave me now, Mr. Standish. Uh, yes, Duchess. Ah, Mr. 
Standish. Perhaps now Miss Kate will dance with you. Hmm? Dance with me? Yes. It's been observed that Miss Kate has danced not once with you all evening. Oh. Can it be, sir, that she is almost of a mind to break with you? Hmm? Kate, break with me. <laughs> now listen, Thrussell. We're going to be married and have three children. One of them dies at the age of seven of smallpox and is buried in St. Mark's churchyard. Now that's absurd, isn't it? But you believe it, don't you? Well, uh, uh, since you can read Kate's future, uh, perhaps you'll inform me also of Helen's. Helen's future? No. No, I don't know that. I don't know. After the guests have departed, Lady Anne, truthfully, I have never attended such a ball in all my life. Oh, but it was horrible, horrible. Horrible? Why, Helen. The Duchess, Peter. She repeated the things you said. Things that don't sound like you at all. Oh, why, I... I just dazzled her with a couple of epigrams borrowed from a fellow named Oscar Wilde. A friend of yours, Peter? No, he won't be around for a couple of gener... <laughs> well, never mind. This is just a little bit complicated. Complicated? You know. Oh, dear, dear. The Duchess is afraid of you, Peter. And Helen, you are not even commonly civil to poor Mr. Thrussell. Oh, oh I'm, I'm distracted. Cousin? Yes? We've been speaking with Sir Joshua, Kate and I, before he left. He would destroy your portrait, sir. Ah, he would, but he won't. He'll complete it. Painters have good eyes, cousin. What is it that Sir Joshua sees and we do not? How did you ever get into this house? You walked in here, but no one saw you. You remember the rain, Tom? His shoes were dry. Stop it at once. Uh, madam, if I, could, if I could have a moment alone with Kate? Indeed, yes. Come, Helen. Tom. Kate, you mustn't talk like this. We're going to be married. Never. I fear you as I fear the devil. I'm leaving here in the morning for Butley. We are going to be married, Kate, and have children and live here. That, that happens. Look at me. Look at me and tell me that you love me. Oh, I, I can't. I can't say that. Kate, wait. Wait, go to Budley, but you'll return. And when you see me again, I may be changed. I may not be the same man. I may feel differently then about, about Helen and Thrussell. And if I do, promise me that you'll stand by Helen. She'll be alone. She'll need your help. Why, Helen, I thought you'd all gone to bed long ago. She told me, Peter. Try to forgive her. Oh, she simply discovered that I don't love her. But you wanted her to marry you. I had to play a part. That was all. Peter, how can you know of things that haven't happened yet? Now, first there was my shawl. And, oh, since so many things. Tomorrow seems as real to me as yesterday. Oh, I want to see ahead, too. I want to know all the wonderful things that are coming after we are dead. Yes, you're in love with the future just as I was in love with the... Why? Why do you want to know? So that I can make Kate understand and be happy with you. And because I love the world and being alive, I want to see ahead because I love it so. Kate would never understand, Helen. Peter, please. The things you have seen. The things I've seen? Yes. Uh, where shall I begin? That, 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 that candle there. Helen, long after us, this room, Barclay Square, all of London will be flooded with light brilliant beyond any candle. All by the movement of one man's hand. By magic. But what would it be like, Peter? It... Ah, oh, it's no use. There aren't words to tell you. I could see them, Peter. Through your eyes. Ah, oh, but that isn't possible. Peter. Helen. Helen, your eyes. They... They burn. This room. Yes. It blazes with your magic light. And there on the wall, your portrait. It's finished. Sir Joshua finished it as you said he would. The veil is thin for you. A man and a girl. I can see them, too. Oh, they're dressed so queerly. The man. He, he's like you, Peter. Oh, don't, Helen. Yes, I will. I will see. And outside in the sky, great birds bigger than a hundred eagles. Machines with men in them. 
And water. There's water, the ocean. That great floating mountain there. A ship. No sails. No masts. And beyond, a great cluster of towers reaching into the clouds. Only a city across the sea. Oh, a fairy city. Men who fly like birds. They cross the ocean. Their houses pierce the sky. They'll conquer evil. Oh, Peter, they'll be like angels. Not men. Close your eyes, Helen. I will see. I will see. Oh, devils there are. Demons. Close them. With masks on their faces. A yellow mist is around them. They fall, they twist in the mud. Lights flare everywhere in a great flame. It opens like a flower. A flower that blows 50 men to bits. Curving streams of fire. Pumped out of hoses to shrivel men like insects. Oh. 1917. And it will happen again in another generation. You want to see more of the future? But it isn't true. God would never have put us here to suffer for a race of fiends like that. There must be beauty there, too. And love. There must be. Yes. Yes, there is. Helen, try and understand, and if you can't understand, then believe what I tell you now. I have come to you from that other world. A world you must forget, just as you must forget me. Forget you? You know I can't do that, Peter. I love you, Helen. God help us both, I love you. I loved you before I ever saw you. In my first dream of you. Coming from somewhere far away to meet me. Oh, this is no part I'm playing now. I'm myself. Myself. Oh, take me with you, Peter. No, I can't. I can't. That isn't possible. It isn't my life or yours. It isn't my world or yours. Oh, don't leave me. Don't go and leave me. No, I'll never leave you, Helen. Never. never been a kiss like this since the world began. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Return with Act Three of Barclay Square in a moment. Meanwhile, over at the Allens' house, they're doing their Christmas wrapping early. There's bright paper and Christmas ribbon all over the living room floor. Oh, honestly, the ribbon slipped again. Honey, come put your finger on this knot, will you? I never knew a woman yet who could tie a square knot by herself. Now, no remarks. This is your present to Dad I'm doing. Now, just hold your finger still a minute. There. Hmm, this pretty paper. Where'd you get it? Looks nice. Isn't it cute? Someone gave it to us on a package last year, so I saved it and ironed it smooth. Oh, what a thrifty wife you turned out to be. But you don't have to pinch the pennies that hard, honey. As a matter of fact, uh, I was just thinking, maybe we ought to get someone to help you with the, the housework and the dishes and things. Oh, Bill, you darling. As if there were such a thing as a maid these days. Now, whatever made you think of that? Oh, say, um, before you sit down, turn on the radio. Sure. Thrifty, too. Lux does up to twice as many dishes, ounce for ounce, as any of ten other leading soaps tested. So if strong soaps have left your hands rough and red, change to dental thrifty Lux Flakes. Remember, you can change dishpan hands to soft, smooth Lux hands for less than a penny a day. Why, maybe that's what's wrong with my hands. That strong soap I've been using for the dishes. I'll have to get some luck tomorrow and see. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Three of Barclay Square, starring Ronald Coleman as Peter Standish and Maureen O'Sullivan as Helen. Once again, it's the present time. In Barclay Square, the rain beats against the black windows. The clock ticks on. 
And Peter Standish continues the account of his incredible journey into the world of yesterday. I had gone back to live for as long as it pleased me the life of another man. The life of the Peter Standish who was my ancestor. But I could play the part no longer. The man in love with Helen Pettigrew was not my ancestor, but myself. And now I knew I never could leave her. Never. My attentions to Helen became obvious to the household. They talked about it constantly. Then, suddenly, Kate returned from the country. You're not neither me nor Helen. I've come back from Budley to save my sister, and save her I shall. You'll return to Budley this very day. Well, she throws away 10000 for herself, and now she'll keep Helen from bringing it to the family. If Thorsel here understands these altered circumstances, surely you can and will. I understand the difference between his 10,000 pounds and my 1,500 pounds. My affection still rests with Miss Helen. If Miss Helen loves Mr. Standish, sir, they must marry at once. Are they not seen together constantly? Where are they now but riding in the countryside again? Milady, Mr. Standish is no fit mate for any mortal woman. Then you know. You know. Yes, he cast his spell on me, but God took pity. He saved me. We must pray that he save Helen, too. Quiet, they've returned. A cousin? Yes? We'd have a word with you, sir. You've a moment, Mr. Standish? Oh, a century, madam, if you wish it. Where is my sister? Uh, gone to her room, I believe. Mr. Standish, before I came home, I stopped at the American legation. You did what? Yes. I had made a list of ten of his phrases, expressions of speech. Should not the American ambassador, Mr. Adams, know what words are used in New York? Uh, he, he's a Massachusetts man. Well, he had heard not even one of them. These words are not used in America, nor in this world. Peter Standish came from New York on the General Wolf. His body stands there. But what have you done with his soul? <laughs> his soul goes marching on. Now listen, all of you, in your silly way, you're trying to help Helen, and I love you for that. But I've seen your civilization, your fine city. And I tell you what's needed here is a new fire of London. A new plague. Dirt, disease, cruelty, smells. Lord, how the 18th century stinks. Sir. Madam, madam, I've seen you in Sheridan's plays. Read you in Jane Austen's novels. Plowing straight ahead over everything like a tank lumbering through the mud. You hear that, Kate? Like a tank. There's your 11th strange word from the lexicon of Beelzebub. Peter Standish came from New York aboard the General Wolf, did he? Well, Peter Standish came from New York in five days aboard the Queen Mary. So I make a few more blunders? So I drive you back to Budley, Kate, at 50 miles an hour? No, not in a broomstick, in an automobile. Ah, you're all over and done with. You're dead in your grave. Ghost! Stand aside from the door. Stand aside. Stop her. She'll tell Helen. <laughs> Clear out. Get back to your grave. Ghost? Grave? Mr. Thrussell, you're a dead and buried little pipsqueak. Let me alone. Uh -huh. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 Exorcism. Thrussell cast out Exodus. the devil. Banned Exodus. by Exodus. bell, book, and candle. <laughs> Did you smell the brimstone, uh, Thrussell? Uh, Shall I show you my cloven uh, hoof? Am I to vanish in a clap of thunder? I'll set ten little devils on you. Imprisonment. Imprisonment for life. For life. In this filthy little pigsty of a world. Peter. Yes? They told me, Peter. Told me how you feel. As one alive among the very dead. Helen, we'll leave here. You and I. We'll go to America. People would hate and fear you anywhere. Oh, I can face them all. For you belong to me, Helen. Not to them. Each night I've said... He must go back. But each morning when we'd be together again, I'd think, oh, only let me have one more day. Helen, I couldn't live my own life without oh, you. What life is this for you? Be brave, Peter. We two alone have been chosen for this wonder out of the millions of lovers since time began. Our love is more real than if you'd been born in my world or I in yours. Because it is a miracle. That we've come together at all. Doesn't that prove we weren't meant to lose each other? Yes, and we shall be together. Always, Peter. Not in my time or in yours, but in God's. Helen, you love me. You can't want me to go back. You love me. 
with all my soul. Then I stay here. My world's a nightmare to you, Peter. A living death. Because you love me, you condemn us both to that. No. No, leave me while our love is still beautiful. I ask it for my sake. Oh, Helen. You have your own life to live out in the future. Don't be too sad there about a girl who's been dead so long. As I grow old, your youth will seem to me eternal youth. For you will come, won't you? Young, as I see you now, to my grave in St. Mark's churchyard. To you, that will be tomorrow. And yet it will be generations after I am dead. Oh, Helen. I'll ask for a stone with the letters cut deep. So they won't wear away before you come to me. Helen, I love you only. Now and in my own time. And in whatever time may come. And I believe. If only you could take back with you. Just one thing that was mine. Wait. There is something. This. Father found it in Egypt when the fleet was there. In some strange way, it meant so much to me. The Ansata Cross. Symbol of life, of eternity. Helen... That was mine. This little thing has crossed the great darkness between us. Mine while I lived. And yours in a world that I shall never see. Go, Peter. Go now. Please. Oh, Helen. No. No. This was our parting. Please. This was our parting. Helen. No more. No more, dear shadows. I had made my journey across the bridge of time, connecting today and yesterday, and I had returned. Behind me remained the Peter Standish of the 18th century, the man who sailed from America on the General Wolf, who did marry Kate Pettigrew, whose portrait Sir Joshua Reynolds did finish. In his diary, he mentions a sudden happy change in their attitude toward him. He couldn't understand it. He must have had a fever, they said. But they didn't question him. A man with 10,000 pounds a year could afford to be eccentric. The calendar on my desk says September 1939. Next to it is a simple wooden carving, the Ansata Cross. I shall take it with me when I leave for France tomorrow. Earlier tonight, Marjorie was here. Peter, they just told me. You're leaving for France? Yes, tomorrow. But you'll come back. And perhaps when the war is over and things are different, what? Oh, I know, Marjorie. I know. We, we were going to be married. It seems so long ago. Peter, that portrait on the wall, surely you don't think any longer that you are he? No, but... Something has happened. Something which you could never believe. So, well, now it's goodbye, Marjorie. Never mind, Peter. I can't break an old habit. I shall go on looking after you, even if it's from a long way off. Oh, forgive me, Marjorie. You're fine and honest as always, Peter. It's all right. There's very little more to write about. This morning I went to St. Mark's churchyard. There I found a tombstone with these words, cut deep. Here lies in confident hope of the blessed resurrection and life eternal, Helen Pettigrew, beloved younger daughter of Sir William Pettigrew, K.B., Vice Admiral of the Blue, and the Lady Anne Pettigrew, who departed this life December the 10th, 1784, aged 21 years. We shall be together always, Peter. Not in my time, or in yours, but in God's. Our stars will be back for their curtain calls in just a moment. Did you ever think of three as a very important number? 
Plays usually have three acts. A yard of material is three times as long as a foot. Or if you're baking a cake, a tablespoon of shortening is three times as much as a teaspoonful. Here's another three rule. When it comes to washing pretty under things, Lux Care keeps them lovely three times longer. Strong soap, hot water, and rough handling leave delicate lingerie faded and old-looking in no time. And seams often pull, shoulder straps fray, lace gets holes in it. Exactly the same kinds of slips washed the gentle Lux way come out lovely looking time after time. In actual tests, the Lux slips looked nicer after 30 washings than the wash day ones did after only 10. So, if you want to keep those pretty undies of yours, dainty and new looking longer, stick to gentle Lux care. They'll stay pretty extra long, three times longer. Now, back to Mr. DeMille and our stars. And now our thanks to Ronald Coleman and Maureen O'Sullivan for their very able and sincere performances in Barclay Square. You gave us a fascinating play to do, Mr. DeMille. Uh, did you read, Maureen, where one columnist reports that uh, Barclay Square is going to be made into a musical at uh, 18th Century Fox? <laughs> 18th Century Fox. I mean 20th Century Fox. <laughs> I've been rather moved by tonight's play. <laughs> you, you certainly I, were moved about two centuries. I should think Barclay Square might make an excellent musical, Mr. DeMille. Yeah, think of the chances for song titles. This is a lovely way to spend an eon. Or <laughs> not gets in your eyes. <laughs> As for costumes, think what you could do with bustles. And think what you could do without them. Oh, Maureen. <laughs> well, for a musical, we'd have to have a smash finale. <laughs> that, that ought to take place in the 22nd century. Uh, but uh, how, how do you know what the 20th second century will be like, Ronald? Well, I look into my crystal ball and I see... Well, that's funny. Why, what do you say? So this thing must be inside out. I'm looking back to 15th century Paris and there's Francois Villon. Oh, you're saying this stage next Monday night. Lux Radio Theater, Christmas night? Yes. We've chosen for Christmas that delightful and stirring operetta, The Vagabond King with Dennis Morgan, Catherine Grayson, and J. Carol Nash. It's the story of a lovable romantic rogue, a poet who ruled for a day and who loved for a lifetime. And with it goes the enchanting music of Rudolph Frimmel and the singing of two of the screen's most lovely voices. Well, that sounds like a very happy Christmas, Phoebe. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'm glad we met on Boxley Square. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Dennis Morgan, Catherine Grayson, and J. Carol Nash in The Vagabond King. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Now, an important reminder to housewives. There is still a critical shortage of waste fats and greases needed to help win this war more quickly. Save every drop of waste fats from your kitchen. Strain them into a clean can and rush them to your butcher. He'll give you four cents and two red ration points for each pound. Ronald Coleman may currently be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Technicolor picture, Kismet. Heard in tonight's play were Dorothy Lovett, Charles Seal, Gloria Gordon, Leslie Dennison, Claire Verdera, Jacqueline DeWitt, Colin Campbell, Eric Snowden, Norman Field, Gwen Delano. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear The Vagabond King with Dennis Morgan, Catherine Grayson, and J. Carroll Nash. Jingle bells for Christmas cake. Try Kate Smith and Aunt Jenny's Holly Wreath Nut Cake, made with new Easy Make Spry. It's super delicious with the flavor of orange and almond and nuts. Stays fresh so long you can enjoy it all through the Yuletide. Look for the recipe. See the Spry ad in newspapers and December women's magazines. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Vagabond King with Dennis Morgan, Catherine Grayson, and J. Carol Nash. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.